ready. We should be ready to go. All right. Uh, let me turn down the volume a bit on the music side. There we go. That should be good. And there. All right. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, welcome to... I, I'm back. I'm I, it's been weeks now, but I finally got my butt up and back behind the computer to stream. So, um, welcome to the next edition of Deer and Projector Lights, the uh, series where I take a look at and discuss the recent film releases that have been coming out. So... Is the chat box not... I just realized something. There it is. I've had that messed up this whole time. Well, anyway. Um, so yeah, this series, I discuss the some of the recent releases that I've been seeing. Uh, a lot more since it's been a couple of weeks. And uh, I'm trying to get back up into the swing of things and get a schedule set so I can actually just follow it. But, uh, so yeah, let's head on over to that. And make, yeah, it should be good there. All right. So for uh, this week, we're going to start off with one of the, pr probably the biggest release last week, actually. Um... And the first uh, Marvel Cinematic release for theaters, at least, Black Widow. Um, now, Black Widow was interesting. Uh, for one thing, this movie should have been released probably like 10 years ago. Not even 10. No, not 10. That would have been... 10 years would have been 2010, which would have been before... I mean, you could do it 10 years ago, but at least five years ago... Uh, when right after the events of Civil War, which is when it takes place. But due to events behind the scenes, specifically the fact that the Marvel Entertainment, the comics and TV side of things, were uh, was headed by Ike Perlmutter, who is a bigoted and backwards-thinking, just absolute bastard of a human being. Uh, he's the reason why... Um, he's part of the reason why... Uh, Terrence Howard was recast with Don Cheadle because even though it's not confirmed, Ike Permoter is the type of person who thinks, well, Don Cheadle, Terrence Howard, they all look alike. That's the kind of person Ike Perlmutter is. And so Kevin Feige finally got out from under Perlmutter's thumb uh, about the time of Iron Man 3 or Avengers 2. One of those times, because it was right after um, Robert Downey Jr. wanted a... A high, an increase in his salary for all the since he basically carried the uh, MCU up to that point, and um, Feige told uh, the head of Disney, "Like, look, either you get me out from under him, or I and let me be in charge and handle things, or I'm out." And Disney's like, "Well, I like money, so yes, we like money, so yes, we are going to let the guy who is making the money currently have it have his way." Uh, the drama behind the scenes is fascinating. But anyway, um, as for the movie itself, solid B tier for me. I know some people think it's actually, some people have it uh, lower. They think it, I've heard, uh, I've had some friends who consider it uh, on the same level as Thor The Dark World. I had enough fun with it that it wasn't that bad for me. But the longer I sat with it, the more I felt like it's kind of inconsequential. Uh, the, pro the plot here uh, is in the aftermath of uh, Civil War. Uh, Natasha is on the run and decides to return and decides to try and hide out in Norway. Unfortunately, as that's going on, her quote unquote sister. Uh, and they explain in the opening that basically. Natasha was part came to initially came to America as part of an undercover operation by the Soviet Union to uncover some secrets uh, with 
um, Rachel Vice as her as her you know undercover mother, uh, and then David Harbour at, who plays the Red Guardian, who was a long-standing like Soviet era kind of villain for Captain America as her as her as her undercover father, and then Yelena Belova, who is another Black Widow, usually featured as part of the Dark Avengers. That's my familiarity with her, but she's a secondary Black Widow uh, title holder uh, as her sister. But they, bo both Natasha and, and Yelena, Yelena are part of the Black Widow program, and, and as um, Natasha return, goes into hiding in Norway, she gets contacted by, you know, she... Get, receives con you know some contact from uh, Yelena secretly, and is then attacked by Taskmaster, who I won't go into too many spoilers, but the, the Taskmaster Taskmaster in this movie is nothing like Taskmaster in the comics or any of the other media. It's a new take on the character, and I'll give my thoughts on Taskmaster later. But, but yeah, but Natasha gets attacked by Taskmaster and is. Suppose and gets sent down the river. She returns to Budapest, Budapest, where she, where she and Yelena re, um, uh, meet finally re, re, you know, re meet again after so long, and that's where we get actually some insight into what the Budapest mission mentioned in the event. There's a bunch of Avengers references here. Um, they. Uh, there's actually a throwaway line that uh, Loki gives about her, Natasha being somebody's daughter, this Drakov's daughter or something like that. And they establish here that Drakov is the head of the Black Widow program, essentially, played by Ray Winstone. And Drakov is who Natasha initially thought she assassinated in order to escape the Black Widow program and defect to... America and become part of the Avengers. Well, Shield initially, and then the Avengers. And turns out that that's not what happened, and that the Black Widow program has been going stronger ever since she left. And Yelena has finally broken free of this thing where ba it's basically mind control. And so Yelena wants to free the other Black Widows from this from this mind control. And to do that, they have to get the family back together, quote unquote. And so they they break Red Guardian out of a Soviet prison in a great sequence, probably one of the better sequences of the movie, and uh, then find Rachel Weisz's character, who is a former Black Widow herself, and is more on the, but is much more of a scientist. Uh, character, you know, she, she is big on the science side of things after she kind of got too old, quote unquote, for the for the field work, and so. That all that all convenes in a big uh, fight in the red room, where they try to take the whole th try to take the Black Widow program and Drakov down. That's that's the basic premise. That's all you need to know going in. That that shouldn't spoil anything else. Now, for me, uh, I was actually less interested in the top. That's the thing. Scarlett Johansson's. Natasha Romanoff has never worked for me, mainly because Scarlett is act is not exactly a great actress. She's much more of a movie star. By that I mean, think of it this way: you don't hire Tom Cruise to play a character; you hire Tom Cruise to be Tom Cruise. You hire, and that's basically how I see Scarlett Johansson. You don't hire Scarlett to be a character usually sometimes you know like in jojo sometimes in like indie stuff she's able to really push it but in most major releases she's in she's usually just scarlet and when she's natasha romanoff she's basically scarlet johansson she's not a character you know i never bought her for a sec mainly because she's supposed to be a Ru a russian defect to the United States and then never it barely speaks Russian and when she does it's with her South SoCal accent so yeah <laughs> um, but I was more interested in the new introductions specifically Yelena is because played by Florence Pugh who was actually putting on a Russian accent or at least attempting one 
Uh, David Harbour as Red Guardian because he looked like he was having a blast. And the t- character of Taskmaster. And I'll get into my um, thoughts on Taskmaster in a bit. But yeah, I like I like the inc- I think the Budapest incident could be its own movie. And sadly, it's just relegated to dialogue and only one shot like Hawkeye doesn't even show up. So there's no like re- we don't really get to see what happened. It's just Natasha explaining what happened and then a single flashback scene. But uh, I think overall, this is a fairly solid spy movie. I think this would be one of the mid-tier Bond films in terms of, like, a good spy movie. It's a spy action movie. It's not very well thought out. It's It hits all the, but, it hits all the right beats, though. So it's not the best... Ri- I think that's the thing, is that this is not an amazingly well-written movie, and I wonder how many rewrites it went through over the course of its development. But, um... Yeah, I, I, I'm not to say that Johansson is bad in this movie either. She's not bad. In fact, she's never... I, I think that's the thing is that I don't see the hype because all I ever see is just her reading, her reading the lines, but still giving the emotion. But I don't see her becoming a character, if you get what I'm saying. Like, Florence Pugh in... As Yelena is completely different from Florence Pugh as one of the little one of the sisters in Little Women, like they're completely separate performances, completely separate characters. David Harbor as Red Guardian is different from David Harbor as the dad in Stranger Things or as Hellboy. Which, personally speaking, I actually don't hate the 2019 Hellboy. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna be alone in that boat, but. So be it. Uh, David Harbour as Red Guardian is kind of the, you know, in high school, I threw this many touchdowns. We totally won the game. The, the guy who's stuck in the past and his former glory. And uh, I feel like they did him dirty a bit because he had, they set up all of these great character moments for him to develop and, and over the course of the movie, but they're all played for laughs. Like, all of, of his real character moments are basically played for laughs. And I think that's kind of undercutting what you could do with David Harbour as Red Guardian. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Rachel Vice is good, but Rachel Vice is good in everything. Um, Ray Winstone is good. Barely trying a Russian accent. Uh, he's not bad, especially when he and uh, Natasha finally face off. He's definitely menacing, but it's hard to take him seriously as a villain. He's he's kind of he's kind of he's not great. Honestly, I feel like if you gotten somebody Eastern European, like you could have got like you could have gotten a Dolph Lundgren or I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think of Eastern European actors of that age. And, or maybe it's like some Russian actors. Um, yeah, man. No, that's all the old ones. Bella Lugosi, Bella Lugosi and them. Um, who's working now? Usually, usually Google's good about that. Here, over forty. Uh, da, da, da. That's just European. I need Eastern European. God damn Google. No, I don't want British actors. I want like Eastern European, Slavic, Russian. Here, let me just do Russian actors. Seventy of the most beautiful Russian. A- I no. I give me a list of currently working like Russian actors in Hollywood. That's all I'm asking you to do, for God's sake. Uh, um, okay, here we go. Uh, Ravil Ishyanov uh, from The Last Ship and Defiance. That'd be good. Um, uh, Michael Gore from Die Another Day and The Hitman's Bodyguard. 
Mm, a couple of these guys are younger. Igor to G Igor to GG Kine from Kingdom of the Crystal Skull and Hunter Killer. Would be wouldn't be too bad. I'm trying I'm looking for older guys. Hmm. Anyway, um the point is like I feel like getting somebody who at least could envelop that for like basically somebody who you could tell was former KGB. I never got that from Way Winstone. He's just kind of, he's kind of at that point where where he's just above Bruce Willis and giving a shit when he performs and uh but still not like it's still you're still not going to get like the best performance out of him. You you just kind of get him to be a tough, you know. You basically get him to be like a cockney mob boss sort of thing not so much like the head of a soviet era spy program but um in any case i'm trying to think uh, i covered johansson um the overarching plot though the whole idea of natasha making amends for her mistakes not only in the way she treated her family because even though the family bit is like the whole the whole time they're like we're not a real family blah 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 and then by the end of the movie they do see themselves as this family unit because they do care about each other and it just takes the course of, a, of the, the events of the movie to make them realize that that's not bad uh natasha making amends for the budapest you know basically the past coming back to haunt you and making amends for it that's all solid writing that's all solid like thematic writing the way it's executed is kind of a, a bit messy. It's not well executed. But um, I, the humor, for the most part, David Harbour especially, I had fun with initially watching him. And, you know, it just kind of sucks in retrospect that, like, oh, wait, all of his really good character moments that he could have had were undercut by him being the butt of the joke. And I feel like that's kind of unfair. Like, he could have had those real character moments, like, Florence Pugh did, like Scarlett Johansson did, like Rachel Weisz did, and yet all of his are played for jokes, and I feel like that's kind of a mistake in retrospect. Uh, the other thing is they're definitely teasing a bunch of spinoffs. The after credit scene is ties into um, something, something from Falcon and the Winter Soldier. I won't say what. Uh, we're definitely going to see more Florence Pugh. I get. I feel like you could actually spin off the event the the ending of this movie into its own mcu series in fact i wouldn't be against that but um overall like black widow is not going to be one i return to like there are some mcu movies i could watch again and again civil war infinity war the first iron man um winter soldier or the guardians of the galaxy movies this is probably like that first Thor movie or Ant or the first Ant Man movie a bit for me. In fact, it's in fact it's kind of a lot like that first Ant Man movie where it feels like it's a bit of a mess. It's not quite you know solid yet, but yeah. Um, I mean, I'm it took long enough. This is feels this feels like more of an afterthought. Like this was way overdue for Scarlett Johansson, and she finally got her solo feature film as, after her character died in universe and it's basically you know kind of like in retrospect oh by the way here's your thing and then we're also mainly going to use it to spin off into other stuff and set up stuff for the next phase of the marvel universe feels kind of you know it feels kind of like a, 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 a like they never really handled natasha well in the mcu i feel like most of the female characters were never really handled perfectly Come to think of it, because that's the thing I remembered from my rewatch into Endgame was how specifically Natalie Portman's Jane Foster was completely mucked up by the MCU. The way they handled her character is completely, just completely. You know, it's no wonder she didn't she didn't think highly of the character because. What did they give her character to do? Like they made her a step, you know, they made her a scientist instead of a nurse, but they took out the real character moments and the characterization of Jane Foster and why she's such a good character in order to do it. So no wonder Natalie Portman is wasn't too into that character and so why she's exactly keen on coming back. 
But um, that's what makes me excited for Thor Love and Thunder because Taika Waititi is coming back. They're going to do the um, Jane Foster Thor uh, from the comics run recently. They, they established that uh, Jane Foster was deemed worthy to wield the powers of Thor in the comics and she becomes Thor, and she becomes essentially a version of Thor and that could also be a really cool way to introduce Beta Ray Bill the idea that like these are these other here are these other people worthy of the power of I mean they've already established that Cap was worthy of the power of Thor with Mjolnir in the Endgame and one of the best scenes in the whole franchise so, I mean, the idea that you could you totally use this as a means for introducing Beta Ray Bill and then have him show up in Guardians of the Galaxy, that would be cool. But, um, yeah, I'm very curious because that means Taika is – and Taika has proven that he can make really solid character stuff for Thor and handle it and all the wackiness in stride. And so I'm very curious to see how he handles Jane Foster – and I, I, I believe that now, in, after, and it makes me wonder, because I know Ike Perlmutter was a big hindrance in the early days of the MCU. I'm wondering if his the reason Natasha sucked so hard was partly because Ike Perlmutter didn't care to make her a good character. And since Feige is out from under his boot that now we can have more interesting female characters pop up in the, in the films and have more, you know... Once again, not to say that, like, these are the best things in cinema at all, but, like, I, I just love the idea of this whole, this whole universe of films that is, so far, really well put together. And there's only, you know, it's not perfect, but they know... that But they, you have people who know what they're doing, for the most part... And it's really solid entertainment, if nothing else. But, um, yeah, I'm wondering if that wasn't a pro, you know, if that's part of the reason why Natasha sucked so hard was because they had to work under Ike Perlmutter, who, you know, basically, who basically thought that anybody who wasn't a cis, a cishet white, white dude was unimportant. But, um, yeah, Black Widow is fine, it's solid. Like it's a it's a mid tier MCU movie, you could do worse. Uh, I don't think it's as bad, and I think that's the thing is that when people say Thor: The Dark World is the worst MCU movie, even then, you compare Thor: The Dark World to the likes of, you know, Batman v Superman, or uh, you know some or like the the Dark Universe Mummy movie they did. Thor: The Dark World is not though it's the worst in the MCU. That still makes it, like, mid-tier. <laughs> like, in terms of comparative comparative entertainment, it's mid-tier still. So, yeah. Uh, I want to pay 30 bucks on to see it on Disney+. Plus. If you can see it in theaters, uh, see it in theaters. If not, you can wait. It's not like you need to rush out and see it. Uh, another one that I actually enjoyed seeing in theaters, though was the one that came out before Black Widow. And I finally went back and saw it. And I have to reset up the poster. F9. The, the Fast Saga. That's where we're at now. Speaking of superhero movies... <laughs> yeah, seriously, like, this is a superhero soap opera at this point, and to say otherwise is to deny reality. Um... I am I am not in the boat of fast of the Fast and Furious franchise. Like I have no dog in that race. It's it's a complete, you know, side thing that I never have to really worry about. Like it's completely stupid but so entertaining that like you don't care that it's stupid. Hold on. Like, by this point in the franchise, we're bringing back siblings who never were never mentioned before, introduced completely out of the blue. That's why I'm saying this is a soap opera. This is some soap opera level writing here. And the deliveries are all, are for the most part, pretty bad. 
if not outright terrible. Every you know, they're to the point now where they're getting completely meta to meta textual with the humor, where Tyrese even Tyrese's character basically breaks the fourth wall and questions questions the very elements of reality itself. <laughs> Nobody's able to stay dead if they don't want them to. Uh, there's a there's some random Star Wars references actually at one point. Um, they try to bring up physics at the end when they're in space, but completely defy physics for the entire rest of the movie. So I mean, this is this is where we're at with the Fast and Furious franchise. It's a complete cartoon, and that's fine. That is absolutely fine because you know what, cartoons can be fun, and this cartoon is fun for the most part when it tries to be super serious and dramatic it's a slog it becomes a slog because these are not dramatic actors and it's really bad dialogue too but when it's being the cartoon that it is it's fun it's a fun roller coaster ride that sort of thing um like i don't know how long they can try to keep this thing going at some point, the money, the people are just going to get tired of the nonsense and be done with it. But until then, you know, they're just going to keep ratcheting it up and be wild and crazy. They've already met, like, they, Vin Diesel's already joked about bringing, com combining with the freaking, um, the freaking Jurassic World franchise and bringing dinosaurs into the mix. Uh, here, let me, let me change the music up a bit um the one problem is i turned it on to be youtube safe and i don't have instrumental only because i don't want lyrics to ch to try and um to try and you know under to, to drown out what i'm saying or you know be distracting in the background and the problem is it's only like two songs in that one playlist, so I'm trying to find a good playlist for that's you that includes YouTube safe songs and um, would be good for background music. So this this might do it. We'll try this one for a bit. Um, get some funk up in here. Uh, back to Fast Nine though. Yeah, it's. It's a complete cartoon. The Dom Dom is ba Dominic Toretto is basically a superhero with super strength, which they established all the way back in Fast Seven when he brought down a um, crumbling, uh, what's it called, uh, park parking deck with his with his foot by stomping on it. <laughs> so they've already established that Dominic Toretto is basically a superhero. Uh, so is Dwayne the Rock Johnson's character, and yeah, it's. It's a com they go to goddamn outer space in this one, and it's absolutely ridiculous. But that's perfectly fine. That is absolutely fine. That it's ridiculous because it's fun for the most part. The action sequences are really solid. The you know the the stunts, as stupid as they are, are still fun to watch. So this is one to see in theaters because it is great for that big screen spectacle. This is a summer blockbuster style movie and that's fine. You don't want to watch this on a tiny screen at home. You want to watch this on the big screen with the surround sound because that's where it's going to be the most fun. It's going to be the most insane to see all that happen on a 90 foot screen with the sounds blasting in your face. So yeah, fast nine. It's fine. Like, it's not my favorite because I'm getting kind of tired of the, the, the soap opera parts of it, but I'm not going to say it's bad either because it's still fun. I still had fun when I was having, when it was at the cartoony roller coaster action parts. It's the parts where they tried to be dramatic and serious that I laugh at unintentionally. So yeah, Fast 9, not bad. Not the worst thing. You know, you could do worse than a Fast and Furious movie out there. It's just, it's just fine. Speaking of doing worse than the Fast and Furious movie, we got to talk about the big release that came out this past weekend. And that is, we got Space Jam. Everything old is new again, including the Space Jam. Unfortunately, the soundtrack isn't any good. So, um, uh, quick thought, my quick thoughts on 
Oh my god, is it just replaying the same song over again? God damn it. There's 400 some odd songs in the funk playlist, and they can only play one for you. To, no, 200. Okay, let's try this one. This one, this, this one has 600 songs. If there's only like two that I can play, then yeah. Actually, this might be epic cinematic for uh, the movie theater, for the movie discussions might actually be good. Anyway, um, I rewatched the original Space Jam for the sequel, and it is bad. Like, it, like I know that people in my age demographic, I'm in my early 30s, and people, you know, the 90s kids, the kids who were born in the late 80s and grew up that were, that were like five or six when Space Jam first came out. I know we have, we kind of like hold it in some regard the same way that a lot of 80s kids hold like the cheesy crap that they saw at that age. I get it. I understand that you, you loved this thing as a kid. But I loved a lot of things as a kid too. I loved the 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 Land Before Time directed video sequels. They are not good. They are a lot of them are very bad. And Space Jam is a absolute train wreck of a movie that it's a miracle it got made at all and is a pure sign of just the insanity of the 90s. The best thing about that movie is the soundtrack. Let's be real. Like the plot of the Monstars and having to win at a basketball game, all because Michael Jordan did some commercials with Bugs Bunny for Nike. It's it, it's so bad. It's basically, this is why Michael Jordan didn't try to do more movies after this, because he was not good in the movie. He, was, he could barely play himself on screen. It's so bad. And the Looney Tunes felt out of character at a lot of points. And the whole thing was just just a slog to sit through. And the only good parts were the soundtracks. Because you had things like the Space Jam song by... Um, oh, God. Who did, this, who did the original Space Jam song? Um, who did the Space Jam theme? Uh, come on. Quad City DJs. So you got the Quad City DJs. You got... Um, you had... Um, Buster Rhymes, I think, for the Monstars theme, Hit Em High. Uh, da, 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 here, let me pull, just pull up the the soundtrack listing. I mean, you have R. Kelly, too, who at the time, we weren't quite aware of just how much of a piece of shit he actually is, but yeah, Fly Like an Eagle, uh, Co the Fly Like an Evil cover by Seal, who I didn't realize uh, was did that cover. I thought it was just the... Um, who did the original Fly Like an Eagle? Steve Miller Band. Like, I just thought it was the Steve Miller Band thing. I didn't realize it was Seal doing a cover. But, um... You, uh, da, da, da. Yeah, Be Real, Busta Rhymes, Coolio, LL Cool J, and Method Man all did the, all rapped on the Monstars anthem, Hit Em High. <laughs> oh, God. Salt and Peppa are on the soundtrack. Barry White and Chris Rock, all 4 1. Uh, Spin Doctors. And then you had. Uh, Jay-Z was featured on a track. Then you had um, Bugs Bunny. The I think it was um, Billy West as Bugs Bunny doing a rap at the tail end of the of the, of the album. But, um, yeah, I mean, you had, like, the some of the best in 90s hip-hop and R&B on that soundtrack. That soundtrack is better than that movie. It is wild how good that soundtrack is. But, um, yeah. The first Space Jam is bad. I think we need to just establish that Space Jam was bad and move on from it. So we can talk about the, the fact that we have a sequel starring LeBron James. Now, 
there is one major improvement to Space Jam that this movie did. We have character arcs and a thought-out plot. Not to say that they're good, but the fact that LeBron James isn't just is not playing this is actually playing a fictional version of himself in that he starts out being all serious, only cares about basketball, only thinks of things through basketball, and it is through the course of the movie that he begins to realize how that was hurting his son and how that was a limiting and that how that was got him into trouble to begin with that things can't always be viewed through the lens of basketball and that he needs to grow as a character and become a better person and he does so through the events of the movie lebron james has a character arc michael jordan merely existed the plot makes more sense in a way instead of the looney tunes existing in the center of the earth and having to be or i don't know the, the logistics of the first space jam it doesn't make any goddamn sense and space jam a new legacy it takes place on the warner brothers server verse which is basically a you know a server room that allows itself to exist in si in the ones and zeros as represented by Don Cheadle and the various Warner Brothers properties. So the Looney Tunes exist within the serververse held in Warner Brothers Studios. It actually makes sense more than how Michael Jordan got involved with the Looney Tunes in the first movie. That's about all this has going for it, really. Uh, the animation for... LeBron James, because LeBron James becomes animated and spends basically the entire second act of the movie as an animated character. Um, that's good. I I, I I thought the animation was actually better in some points than the original Looney Tune, the original Space Jam, which was really solid animation in its own right. Uh, apparently, they did not credit a couple of the animators, at least one I know of, which is horseshit because uh, no. No, nobody. No matter if you're an independent movie or or a ma especially if you're not if you're a major studio, nobody should go uncredited for their work. The fact that people uh, the people were on this movie is 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 a shame, and it's uh, you know you should shame Warner Brothers for uh, for allowing that to happen. But um, yeah, the the humor. Is a bit hit and miss. Some of the times the humor with the Looney Tunes is on point. Some of the times it's really lame. And especially when they did the uh, corporate synergy based co uh, comedy references. Like, the, like that's the thing. The Looney Tunes have been making references since the since ever. They always made references to pop culture. Like there were whole episodes dedicated to making references to old Hollywood. Making references isn't the problem. The problem is they don't really work. They just exist because Warner Brothers owns the rights to The Matrix, to Austin Powers, to Mad Max, to King Kong, to The Iron Giant. So these references don't really do anything because it's just there because Warner owns the rights to it. And yeah, the whole thing reeks of corporate synergy. Like, hey... Hey, we need you to include these properties. You know, make sure you mention Harry Potter. Make sure you mention Game of Thrones. Make sure you can mention all the fine things they can watch on HBO Max. It's so, so bad. And yet, Don Cheadle as the villain is fun. He's a blast. He Don Cheadle chews up every last bit of scenery he's in, and he is having a good. He's having a good time doing it. So Don Cheadle at least made his scenes worth watching because Don Cheadle's a goddamn professional. He knows that, like, look, I'm a mustache-twirling villain, so I'm going to play that up. So I am going to have some fun with this. Uh, and, of course, I don't know if you've seen, there is a point during the basketball game where it diverges into a rap battle with Porky as the notorious P.I.G., and it is as cringeworthy 
as you think it is if you haven't seen it. It is the worst part of the movie by far. And yeah, it's it's actually kind of surprise. I have not heard or seen anything about the new movie soundtrack. Like the like I mentioned, the first movie had like the biggest names in '90s era hip hop and R&B. I'm looking at the new soundtrack. We've got Lil Baby, okay. Chance the Rapper, John Legend, okay. That's not bad. Lil Uzi Vert, eh. John Legend showing up again. The Jonas Brothers. Rock Hampton, Joyner Lucas, Leon Bridges. I think I, I'm, I'm recognizing some of these names. I don't know Corday and Duckworth. Um, St. Jun featuring SZA. Saweetie with salt and pepper and cash doll. 24K Golden I with Lil Wayne. I don't know if that you would if you if I would call those the best hip hop. I mean, the, there's the Jonas Brothers in here for God's sake, for no for for some goddamn reason. It's like who the hell let who the hell let the Lily White Boys from Disney come in for this to this soundtrack? God damn! Like at least John Legend and Chance, you know Chance the Rapper, people. People who you recognize, even if you don't listen to their music. Uh, I don't know anybody outside of, you know, people who listen to hip-hop who would know Lil Baby, Lil Uzi Vert, uh, Lil Tekka and Amine, Dame Dalla, g Easy, Pilo, and White Dave. No, I only know g Easy from that, and it's because he w hit one of Todd in the Shadows' worst of the year lists. I think even, um, uh, the rap critics... One at least one a couple years back. I don't know half of the people on this thing. I couldn't tell. Like that's the thing is like, you didn't have to listen to their music to know who Coolio was, who Salt and Pepper were, who the Quad City DJs are, who you know who the who Seal was. You know you knew who these people were at the time, whether or not you listened to the music. I feel like most of the people on the sound i don't even know if the soundtrack's that good i need to actually listen to it but um i don't know they say it's a star-studded soundtrack i mean there's a couple of stars studded into here you've got lil wayne john legend chance the rapper the jonas brothers those are probably the biggest stars i could think the other ones are just kind of like names i uh, like is little uzi vert a star would you call Lil Tekka and Am Amine stars in hip-hop? Like, star stars. Like, Jay-Z is a hip-hop star, and especially in the 90s when he was at his height. Would you call Brock Hampton a star the same way you would call Coolio or even R. Kelly a star? I will say this, replacing jo uh, R. Kelly with John Legend is a, at least an upgrade on that regard. Because at least John Legend's not an entire piece of shit like R. Kelly. But, um, now I'd have to actually go through and listen to this to see if the soundtrack's even any good. But, um, but the one thing the original movie has going for it, the sequel doesn't even, feels like it didn't even bother on. Um, and yeah, people are mentioning some of the humor is really bad. And yeah, a lot of the humor is really bad corporate synergy driven references. It's, it's bad. It feels like a commercial for HBO Max. That said, I still had a better time watching the sequel than the first movie. If given a choice, gun to my head, watch the first Space Jam or the second Space Jam, I would sooner watch the second Space Jam. I think the second Space Jam at least feels like a movie, even if it's a corporate synergy driven movie. The first Space Jam feels like somebody shit on celluloid and told us to watch it. I don't feel like any real thought went into the first Space Jam. It's just like a coke-fueled nightmare. And at least A New Legacy feels like some thought, not a lot, not a whole lot of thought, but some thought was put into the plot, the character arcs, the character relationships, 
Bugs Bunny has a character arc here, for God's sake. His whole character arc is basically a mirror of LeBron's. And it's at least there's something. There's a th there's a few things here. It's just in a not very good movie. Yeah. So Space Jam: A New Legacy. It's not. You don't need to see this. Really, you don't. But having seen it, I did not hate it the way I thought I would. There is enough good things in the movie. For me to not hate it, I would still not recommend anybody go out of their way to see it, though. And uh, we got one more to talk about. It's not a movie. It's actually a Netflix uh, limited series, until, at least until they end up doing a sequel series. And I don't know. Whoa, that's tiny. And I don't know uh, if they will end up doing it. Because I know this is Netflix bringing it over from a Japanese studio, I believe. Or it's at least a Coke production. But Godzilla Singular Point is at least a better... At least a good Japanese... Uh, not Japanese. Uh, it's at least a good Godzilla anime on Netflix. So at least we have one. Because that anime movie trilogy is hot garbage. But um, Godzilla Singular Point is an interesting reinvention of the Godzilla Toho-verse. Uh, you've got... Basically, you've got... Um, let me see. Uh, I'm trying to pull up the plot here so i because that's the thing is this plot is hella convoluted i would not be you know if, you know there's a reason i kind of think of this as godzilla exposition point <laughs> more than anything else because man is it just like big exposition dumps to try and explain this madness um uh, it's 2030 they have a there, there's these um basically these these um mechanic shop that has a that built a robot that is Jack Jaguar that is their version of Jack Jaguar, and um, meanwhile you also have a grad student studying uh, these creatures and basically quantum physics and whatnot, uh, theoretical physics and all that, and then it starts then basically these mysterious figure um, signals start uh, appearing. This is followed by ter literal pteranodons. Just full-on pteranodons um, that are their version of Rodan. And Rodan is basically like a pest. Rodan is the zoo bat in this universe. It just They're just freaking everywhere. And then um, as the story goes on, uh, this red mist begins to appear. And there's kind of like in a Shin Godzilla... Godzilla goes through these evolu these metamorphic stages as it gets bigger and turns into the Godzilla we recognize... And then while that's going on, Angira shows up. Um, I think one of them is Gavin. Gavin from freaking Godzilla's Revenge. Uh, which monsters show up? We've got Rodan. We've got they got the skeleton of a of a Godzilla, kind of like um, Kiryu, um, and uh, like the skeleton that made Kiryu in that in the Millennium Era. Da -da -da. I think they have Kamunga show up because there's some spider creatures at one point. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Manda shows up as a sea serpent. Dangiris. Da -da -da. Oh, there's multiple Mandas in this one. Um, I missed that reference. Da -da -da. Da -da -da -da. Come on. Hmm. Wikipedia is not being very helpful. Let's just go to um, the Godzilla wiki. Is wiki? I think it's Wikizilla has the more robust stuff. The 
are still going through the and creating the articles though. Uh, ba -ba -ba, ba -ba -ba, cast monsters. Here we go, monsters. Um, Jet Jaguar Salunga. Which is basically, I mean, it's basically Gavin from Godzilla's Revenge, but it's a new monster named Salunga. And he's supposed to be a reference to Hindi mythology. It's, it's uh, Amanda Kamunga. Uh, and then a bunch of other insect kaiju. Mothra's referenced at one point. So yeah, the big ones though are the Rodan. Rodan just becomes a, a menace that goes throughout this that fly that flies throughout the city, causing damage and havoc. Jet Jaguar is a piloted robot, uh, like a drone created that becomes sentient at one point through an AI. Uh, Salunga shows up, and Gira shows up. Salunga is a new addition, uh, and Gira shows up at one point. There's a couple of versions of Manda. And then Kamunga, they fight. There's a couple of other insect kaiju that show up, like flying insects and whatnot. Uh, the big one, though, is um, Kamunga, the spider, and then uh, Godzilla himself. But um, it's it, I, I think the redesigns are interesting. What you've got is hand drawn two-dimensional anime characters and backgrounds with CG monsters, like computer-generated three-dimensional monsters. It's an interesting mix. I think it worked well. And then, um... And then, uh, yeah, the whole evolution of Godzilla, like in Shin Godzilla, was really good. Um... And then the storyline is just... Holy shit. It just... Just full of trying to explain the world it's so much exposition to try and get through so much techno babble so many heady references uh i mean the, the what's nice is that you can tell these people are toho fans at least because well number one they brought back J jaguar of all things and they brought back kamunga and manda like and Giris, yeah he's one of the classics against alongside godzilla but jet jaguar showed up for one rodan Obvious. He showed. He even showed up in King of the Monsters. They brought back Jet Jaguar, who only showed up once. And they brought back Kamunga, who most people probably don't even remember. Uh, it's like if they brought like if they brought back King Caesar or something. You know, like who the hell remembers King Caesar aside from nerds like me? But um, yeah, uh, I think the monster stuff is all fun and. The ideas they were going for are good. Like, I would recommend people check this out, but be prepared. You're not going to get a full-on monster fight. It is not going to be 100% monster fights. And then even during the climax, the monster fights, the monster fight is narrated over with exposition to try and explain this convoluted-ass plot. This plot makes no goddamn sense. But that's, you know, not new for Godzilla either. So, yeah, it's easy to get lost if you're not paying attention. But, yeah, and then um, the ending, like I mentioned, the climax is undercut by the fact that they have to, exp oh, you know, dump exposition over the climactic fight with Godzilla. But, um... They did have a stinger at the end, which is really neat, and teases that there might be a sequel. I don't know if they're... Um, that they've mentioned a that they are working on a sequel or not. <laughs> Let me see if they're mentioning any... Uh, there is a reference to the Oxygen Destroyer at one point, because of course, I... <laughs> that's just like part of Godzilla lore but um I'm not seeing any word on there be there being a sequel so there's plenty of merch they're def they've already started selling the figures in Japan and the the soundtrack is being released has 
uh, it's actually going to be released in a couple of days. But, um, yeah, still no word in if it will be a sequel. If there will be a sequel series. I guess it depends on how well it, uh, it sells, both in terms of people watching it in view numbers and in sale. And in, um, you know, once again, where the real money from this franchise is made, merchandising, merchandising. Godzilla, Godzilla the, the toy, Godzilla the soundtrack, Godzilla the flamethrower. Where's that? I thought I heard somebody come downstairs. Anywho, um, all right. Yeah, hold on. Sorry about that. Uh, my dad was down here getting something. Uh, but yeah, Godzilla the flamethrower. <laughs> uh, I think that's all I wanted to talk about with Singular Point. Yeah, full of Toho references. This, this one, you could feel like the people making it were fans of Godzilla and knew a lot of even like the little idiosyncrasies of like, who the hell brings back Jake Jaguar if you weren't a fan of Godzilla? Uh, who the hell knows Jet Jaguar outside of nerds like me? Um, yeah, so I like the redesigns, the mixing of of, of computer-generated three-dimensional models and the hand-drawn anime characters and backgrounds is an interesting mixture. They blend it really well, which is, you know, not always the case. But I think that, because that's the thing, is anime is becoming a bit more open to the use of computer generation as part of the process when it was mainly just a hand-drawn medium. And I think the inclusion of more and more and playing around, seeing, adapting the, that aesthetic to three dimensions is going to take some time. But I think with the Lupin movie that came out, that was released recently, they prove, they, you know, they've proven that it's possible and even with that recent um ghibli movie that the the aesthetics are there they just need more time to, to you make use of the the techniques that they've you know had decades the better part of a century to to practice and hone with hand-drawn they need to be able to adapt those to computers and i'm very curious to see how anime will look with computer generation stuff because they're like it's it, they're able to be stars has proven it's able to look pretty decent and the lupon movie has proven it's basically you know you're, you're able to do amazing things with it too so i'm very curious to see the future of anime in, in terms of the inclusion of more computer generation but um yeah godzilla singular point i was about to call it exposition point again uh godzilla exposition point is I joke, but it's actually probably the best thing I watched out of the, out of all of these, uh, because I mean, number one, it's a series, so it had a lot more time to delve into a lot more stuff instead of just the two hours. But at the, but you've also got some really interesting redesigns for the, all the Toho monsters that they included. And you've got some really solid characters. I thought the characters in this were pretty decent. I don't remember a lot of the names. Um, but 
uh, I tell you one thing. The the uh, there's this one guy. The, 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 the director general, I think. Um, yeah, research director uh, that May runs into. His daughter is super cute. It, she's she's got that kind of like that tan girl anime that tan anime girl aesthetic, kind of like Nagatoro. She, and she's got that this really cute green shawl that she wears. I just love her design. But um. Yeah, Yun Arikawa, the um, programmer for J Jaguar, the main sort of narrator and focal point protagonist. Uh, he is he's um he's he's pretty decent overall. Uh, the real cool guy though is Goro. Goro is this old dude who is gives not one fuck. <laughs> Goro gives not a single fuck and will dive headfirst into battle in the center, in the middle of Jet Jaguar's body at one point. I think at multiple points he does that. But, um. Yeah, uh, I think overall this is a really solid anime series that is, you know, fun for Toho and Godzilla fans alike, as well as just general anime fans, I think. Uh, it's not like the best out there, but at the same point, um. Oh, it's a. It's a. Bones and Orange Anime Studios. Uh, Orange being best known for Beastars. Speaking of Beastars. And uh, Bones being best known for what? Uh, apparently they do My Hero Academia and Mob Psycho. So... Oh, apparently they also did Cowboy Bebop back in the day and Escaflone. Hey, Escaflone. <laughs> there's a there's a dub that they bungled on the way over here, but uh, so yeah, you got the studio behind Mob Psycho, uh, My Hero Academia, and um, and uh, apparently Bungo Stray Dogs, whatever that is. Um, that's the, that keeps that keeps popping up, but uh, yeah, a fairly long stand. They've been around since the two thousands. Uh, newer series including Wolf's Reign, uh, Darker Than Black, Soul Leader, or in High School Host Club. So, I mean, so yeah, Bones, apparently Bones has been one of the long-standing uh, anime studios. Both, wait, they, they, I think they, wait, did they do both adaptations of Full Metal Alchemist? Huh. That explains it. That's that's where all the, that's why all the hand drawn stuff is so good. You got the people who've been doing it for twenty years, and then you've got the you've got the folks behind B stars doing the CG. Uh, match made in heaven. I'd like to see what else they do with this kind of thing, not just with Godzilla, but like with anything. Like get Orange and Bones to collaborate again. I'm down for it. So yeah, um, Godzilla's singular point is solid. It's a it's a it's a bit convoluted up its own ass, but. If you're a fan of Godzilla, you're not, you know, you know, you're kind of used to that at points. <laughs> the series has definitely gone through that kind of period, but um, the monster fights are fun. The characters are interesting, at least. That's the thing is that people, you know, Godzilla fans will joke like, oh, "Why do you watch Godzilla for the human characters?" But a human character makes the difference between a good Godzilla movie and a great Godzilla, or I guess series or movie. And um, here you got. May, who's an interesting, like, nerdy girl who's in over her head trying to comprehend what's going on, while Yoon is on the front lines with Goro. Goro, it steals the show, really. He's, he's, he is best character. But, um... Yeah, all of the references to, to, to the Toho stuff, all of the really solid a action work and whatnot. Like, the only thing really going against this is the fact that it's a convoluted hot mess and exposition dumps the whole time. But that being, I think a lot of sci-fi is guilty of that. Like, how much techno babble and exposition dumping do they do over the course of Star Trek? So, yeah, um, I would highly recommend you check out Godzilla Singular Point. So, and then if you 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 thought differently, uh, let me know. But uh, yeah, let's. That's all I really watched this past week. Uh, well, two, three weeks, I think, now. 
Uh, I need to see what else is coming out. Oh, God, Snake Eyes is coming out this weekend. That's right. Oh, oh, coming. Let's see what else is coming soon. Uh, n oh, the Green Knight is supposed to finally be coming out. I was waiting for that. Uh, that's the latest from A24. Um, Jungle Cruise is going to be coming out next week. Uh, what's coming out this week? <laughs> oh, the new M. Night is coming out this week. That weird one with Mark Wahlberg where he his kid got committed suicide because he was bullied. Because he was gay. And it's about the dad for some reason it's coming out. Uh... Those are the big ones. Um, so yeah, Snake Eyes and Old. Oof. Uh, then there's a bunch of... St I'm so behind on my Netflix. Uh, there's that one that uh, Chris Pratt did for Amazon that's apparently already getting a sequel. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that's out that I need to check out. But uh, that's all for this week. And uh, we'll hopefully see you next week if I can keep this up. But uh, switch back over to the main... Set up. Yeah, I hope I hope you liked. I hope you uh, enjoyed this whole process I'm going through. I uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and keep up this uh, this series and try to do you know try to see more. I need to see more movies. I just need to see more movies. I honestly just continually default to watching YouTube videos, <laughs> even like old ones that I've seen before. I'm like I watch that again. Because like, I feel like I get stuck and I like don't want to pay attention. Because that's the thing. When If I'm watching a new thing, I pay attention to it. But if, there's, if, if I don't pay, you know, so if I don't pay attention to it, then I get lost. And, when I come, and that's how part of me got lost when I was watching Godzilla <laughs> in uh, Singular Point. So I think I just need to, you know, make sure that, hey, watch one new thing. Like, even if it's not every day, but just like, hey, what are you doing right now? You could watch one of the new things and go do that. But, uh, yeah, we'll see you folks later. Uh, I'm going to try and come back on Wednesday with, uh, with and finish, hopefully, Dream Daddy. But until then, we'll see you. Bye.